Welcome into episode 220 of the Skate Podcast. I'm Brian DeFelice, joined by Bridget Prue and Scott McLaughlin. The Bruins had their first preseason game of 2023-2024 season. 3 nothing win over the Rangers at the Garden. Matthew Patra with a goal and an assist. Uh, Jake DeBrest scored a goal. Johnny Beecher scored a goal. And Brandon Bussey with a 29-save shutout. Bridget and Scott, initial takeaways from the first, first game this uh, this fall. Well, I'd say all, all the names you just mentioned, I mean, Patra has, you know, kind of been in prime position so far in terms of who he's playing with, who he's getting an opportunity to showcase himself with in practice. He's been on the line with David Pasternak now in the game. He's on the line with James Van Riemsdyk and Jake DeBrusque, who were cl- clearly the two best wingers that the Bruins had dressed for this game. Um, and he obviously – Played well, uh, you know, scores on the power play, helps or does set up DeBrusque uh, for a five and five goal. That line in general, you know, I think between the two teams is pretty clearly the the best line on the ice. Um, Beecher is, you, you know, we'll obviously get more into Potter and like his chances of making the team, but he has said he wants to. And, you know, this is good kind of, you know, he's taking the good first steps and, same with Beecher. He's trying to win a spot. Uh, we know that it'll most likely be on the fourth line if he does. But you saw him, you know, scores a goal using his speed to, to race right up the middle of the ice. I uh, think he won definitely won more faceoffs than he lost. I think he was six of ten, maybe, is what he finished. Uh, let me see one second. Seven of eleven. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say the Nesson stat after the game had him at seven face off wins. Yeah, um, yeah, so you know, he does that. I thought he, he made a couple good plays in the D zone, providing support, playing down low. And Brandon Bussey, you know, really was the number one star of the game, obviously, with the 29 save shutout and some terrific saves, including obviously the, the glove robbery of Johnny Brodzinski uh, on a power play chance that. Looked like a short goal on a pass right across the cre- right across the the slot, and you know, Bussy just like out of nowhere flashes the leather. So, th- those guys were were the clear standouts, and certainly the you know the center discussion continues to get more interesting with with guys like Potcher and Beecher stepping up. Yeah, and it, I I believe at the end of our last episode, Scott and I, Brian was on vacation. Um, Scott and I were talking about how Patra is kind of the, the player that we are most interested in seeing how he performed in his, uh, in the preseason. And he, so he gets his first opportunity and he looked great. He didn't, he said that he had nerves early on, but it was hard to tell. I mean, he just seemed pretty smooth. And I think that the advice Jake DeBrus gave him before the game and throughout the game, he said, helped him. He said, uh, he told him just keep it simple and if there's no play to be made, don't force it. Um, and he, he didn't seem like he was forcing it at all. He looked natural. And obviously when you put him in between Van Riemsdyk and DeBrusque, he's kind of set up for the most success out of any of the, the young guys that were in there um, working off of those two guys. His goal on the power play, he had Van Riemsdyk screening out in front, which is another thing that we know Van Riemsdyk can bring that if, you know, if you're a Bruins fan and you haven't, seen much of a sample size of him for one reason or another he's always going to park himself out in front of the net potentially on the power play so we got to look at that as well from him um and debrusque uh, for some reason uh annie brickley made the comment that jake debrusque looks like ready like um regular season ready or something like that and i'm like well he's like a normal he's just he's an everyday player he should he should look ready for the regular season obviously um it was some of the younger guys that we weren't sure what they were going to look like. And I thought that uh, Patra looked very good. Uh, Lysel at times was a bit quiet um, and he's somebody else that we can get into. Um, But the big standouts in terms of positive standouts were uh, definitely Bussy, Patra and Beecher. Yeah. So I, I think I want to start with, with Bussy just because, and there's plenty of good to get to regarding Patra as well. And Beach, as you mentioned, definitely Lysel. Uh, wanted to see more out of him in this performance. Uh, obviously, preseason is, you know, there's more games to go, but it, it's a bit of a sprint, right, to make an impression. And, but for, 
I'll just I'll just say this and I'll throw it back to you guys. But and I know it was one performance, but we know that that Bussy's a a very very strong prospect going into tonight's game. If the Bruins and I know goaltending is a strength of their team, but if if they are in a situation where they can move a goaltender at some point this year or next, whenever it is, right? I have, <laughs> I think I've seen what I need to know that I think Bussy could step in and be one of two NHL caliber goaltenders on this team. And I just think that, you know, yes, it was a preseason game. Yes, it was not against a full Rangers lineup, but he's a very, very strong goaltender. You can just tell the saves he made tonight were outstanding. He has a presence in the crease. He's he's got good size, and we watched last year with Vegas. Like, you know, goaltending is the most important position in hockey, but you can find them more frequently than you can find other positions. And if the Bruins find themselves with a with a with a chance to maybe move one of their goaltenders at some point to benefit the roster elsewhere, all I'm saying is I think I have confidence, even after just one preseason performance, that I think this kid might be the real deal. And when I say real deal, and it, I think he could be a solid NHL contributor and potentially number one at some point. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting. Like a, after last season, you know, I know we talked to both Andrew Raycroft on Sunday skate and Mark Diver when we had him on here and both of them were of the mindset that like Bussy probably needed another full season or, you know, most of another season in the AHL that he could really use the development time. And, you know, my feeling, it, look, Mark Diver obviously saw a lot more of him last year than I did. He sees almost every Providence game. But, like, I looked at it and I was like, the way he kind of just ran with that job in Providence, I know they kept splitting time. Like, Kaiser and, and even Michael DiPietro still played. Um, but, you know, remember, like, Bussy initially – was potentially the goalie was going to go down to the ECHL. I think he even played a couple of ECHL games early in the season, quickly gets promoted and ends up being one of the best goalies in the AHL, uh, 924 save percentage, which was third in the whole AHL, first among rookies. And it's like, I think I am more, Brian, I'm probably with you more along the lines of like, I don't mind just throwing guys in. Like, you know, I think if they're close, you can let them learn, like, the rest of what they need to learn at the NHL level. And Whereas I think Razor and, and, and Diver, while, you know, obviously very smart people who I respect a ton, I do think both of them tend to be more of, like, they want kids to be almost overcooked before they turn pro. Like, like, they would they would err on the side of too much development time rather than not enough. And I get that. Like, there's validity to that. But, yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to, like, see what Bussy really needs to work on, especially for, like, another whole season. Um, it's not a bad thing for him to have another year in the HL. And, obviously, if all Mark and Swayman stay put and remain healthy – and the Bruins don't trade one of them away, then he, that's what he's going to get. He's going to get another full season in the AHL, and that may be just fine. But, yeah, I'm kind of with you. Like, if, if if someone was there, then I wouldn't, you know, and all of a sudden you're going with Swayman and Bussy or Elmark and Bussy, I wouldn't at all look at that and be like, oh, wow, Golden and just became a big question mark. I'd be like, no, nah, I, I kind of think Bussy's probably ready and will and we'll be just fine. Yeah, that one save on Brodzinski was crazy. But he had made a lot of saves before that that were nice. He had a little bit of puck luck, too, a few posts. And then that one time that uh, Regula took it off the line, it hit hit the crossbar, came down, and went onto the goal line. And then it was cleared out by Regula. So um, he mentioned that there was a little bit of puck luck, but there's no denying that he seemed very confident out there. But he was kind of hard on himself in the post game. He was like, oh, I could have controlled rebounds better. I think that, I mean, that's kind of just what goalies do sometimes. But he seemed a little bit nervous in the interview because, uh, you know, you're on TV for maybe the first time ever. I don't know. He seemed like a, he seemed like a nice kid. Um, he went to Western Michigan, was a goalie there for, I think, three years and maybe four. But, um, yeah. I, and, I think three. Yeah, I don't think he yeah, played all four. I don't think so either. I think it was three years. And um, 
And so after the game also Beecher was asked about him because he was in Providence last year and they were both there and everybody was saying how, oh, this isn't the first time we've seen him make a save like that. And, you know, this is a nice, he's a nice guy. He's, you know, we trust him back there. And Montgomery said that, you know, if he doesn't, if he doesn't put up that performance, we're on the wrong side of the score most likely. And he called him the best player on the ice. So um, obviously when you're someone uh, you know, that that's never played an NHL game or you're trying to crack the NHL roster. Um, you want to put up a performance that is uh, grabs attention. And now the buzz is, is going to be about him. The unfortunate part for him is he's not on a team that there's an open spot at goalie, even as the backup. So as of right now, so he, he kind of stole the show, stole the spotlight. And in the post game, they gave uh, on Ness and they gave Patra the, uh, player of the game and, and Raycroft was like, what the hell? No goalie love. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I do think that, and even pasta on his Instagram put up the save and, and like did the, like the mind blown emoji and everybody was, everybody was really enjoying his performance. He did a great job. Yeah. And, and also I would also add that he's 25 years old and it's just, there's a, there's, there's a point in time where I think, he he's ready for 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 NHL duties and yes to your point there there are no current vacancies on the on the Bruins main roster but uh, I do think that that should an opportunity arise I think Boston should feel comfortable that it, in their their depth of that position and um, it's something that I'm sure that they they have eyes they can see that and they're probably gonna continue to explore the question for Boston is can you can you move uh, a number one goalie um, because I don't know. It's just not, it's, 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 it's probably a tough trade opportunity Be- because, because you're probably trading a number one goalie in return for your ideally a center, right. And teams don't just want to give that up. And so it's tough to find a dance partner is my point. Um, but if they do, then I think they, got, they may have something there. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that's a, a market that Don Sweeney has already explored and has been exploring and, will remain open to like, I, you know, I don't think they ever got particularly close to trading a goalie this off season, but I absolutely think they checked around. They tried to see what was out there, what they might be able to get if they did move, you know, most likely all Mark, but possibly even Swayman. Um, and obviously, you know, never felt like that the prices were, were close to right. And we've t- talked about this before, but the Winnipeg Jets came to the same conclusion, which is why Connor Hellebuck is still a Winnipeg Jet, despite, you know, pretty openly being on the trade market. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, one injury somewhere can change that, right? Like, you, you never know. Some team that considers themselves a contender, their number one goalie goes down with some sort of long term injury, and next thing you know, they're asking around. So, yeah, things things can change. Obviously, my expectation as of now is it's going to be all Mark and Swayman, and you know, you're not what they shouldn't do. Obviously, and I don't think any of us want them to do this. Is like you don't trade one of those guys, you know, for pennies on the dollar because oh, we can we can free up money here and Brandon Bussey's ready. It's like now hold hold on to a strength of your team, you know, until until like the right offers out there. Or unless it's out there, and if it's not, then you just ride it out with those two guys again. How you have arguably the best goaltending duo in the league, and Bussy will, you know, excel in Providence again. You hope so. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm sure. I'm sure more performances like this and like a strong start down in Providence for Bussy would, you know, would make Sweeney feel pretty good about. Hey, continuing to just poke around and every now and then see what's out there. And, and it, it goes beyond Bussy too. Like, I know like we haven't seen them in a game yet, but Michael DiPietro has really stood out at training camp to me. I think he's made some, some great saves, especially like battling down, you know, in close, um, you know, drills where there's a lot of traffic around the net. Um, you know, Kyle Kaiser's had some pretty good seasons in the minors. So, uh, there's there is a lot of depth at goaltending just in general throughout the organization. Did you notice they they put a picture of Swayman up when they showed uh 
Bussy's stats at one point. It was like it said Brendan Bussy, and it had like I think it was in the third period, and but the little face like the little square that has like the player and it was just Jeremy Swayman's face and I was dying laughing and then by the end of the game they fixed it and they just put a Bruins logo because apparently they do wow. not have a headshot they do not have a headshot of him on file and I was like that looks like Swayman oh wait that is Swayman that's it's not his twin brother they're not twins um but yeah it was kind of funny so I think a lot of people just tonight are learning who Brendan Bussey is uh and you know the criticism. We know we have a lot of goalie critics in Boston. And you know as soon as somebody starts playing bad, we're going to be getting phone calls. Get that kid Brendan and Bussy up here. Get get Bussy to Boston. Trade, you know, whoever it is that's slumping if, if that happens during the season. So we're definitely going to hear that. Um, did you guys want to move on to uh, – this is so, something that was kind of less of a – storyline I guess you could say but um because we didn't have a lot of the regulars in on defense Saboral got a chance though he's someone we wanted to keep an eye on and then there was uh Callahan was also in and, and uh had some stretches where he did a really good job on the breakout he also had one kind of glaring mistake that I noticed with VC getting in behind him and getting a chance um on Bussy kind of point blank but um thoughts on defense in this game obviously it's a shutout um what do you think of the defense yeah well worth noting right at the top like Sabor also left with an injury um in like midway through the second period kind of taking an awkward hit in the corner that I don't think he really saw coming and was a little hobbled I thought it was a lower body because he was it looked like he was like skating gingerly but uh Montgomery said after the game that it was a hit up high which you know, could be any number of things. Obviously, concussion comes to mind, but we don't know that. Like, they didn't say that. So, um, Montgomery termed it precautionary. Same with Patrick Brown, um, you know, new center signing. He was actually playing on wing this game, but he, he blocked the shot in the first period, was clearly in pain, and then he didn't return to the game. Um, so, you know, we'll see if there's any further updates on those guys uh, in the next few days. But yeah, the rest of the defense, I thought other, you're right, Callahan did get, have VZ blow by him on that one play. Other than that, I, I thought Mike Callahan was their best defenseman in this game. I thought he was really solid for 98% of the night. Um, just good. Can we, get a, can we get a PC plug in here somewhere? Yeah. Yeah. Providence College's own. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, he was, he was good defending. I thought he looked calm with the puck on a stick there. A couple of times he, you know, he's not as agile as like Matt Grizzly, but there are a couple of times that he kind of spun away from pressure in a way that reminded me of like the way that Grizzly does that, um, and gave himself some space to start the breakout. So that was good to see. Um, yeah, I thought Rad Riley Walsh was partnered with him most of the game. I thought he looked pretty good, but. You know, for the most part, this was a decor that we're not expecting any of those guys to really make a strong push. Um, certainly for regular playing time, maybe for a seventh or eighth D spot. But yeah, that I thought Mike Allen was good. And, you know, um, Ryan Mujanel, Providence's coach, has been, uh, was talking him up at the Prospects Challenge, saying he basically had grown out of that tournament and he thought he was ready to, to make a push for the NHL. And, you know, if not, he he was going to be relying on him as a leader down in Providence this year. So, um, you know, clearly someone who's, uh, you know, I think doing a good job improving his stock. Yeah, I I would echo what Scott said. And in, in the essence of of timing here, I'd probably just um, because, as you mentioned, like none of these defensemen are really um, anything more than just organizational depth. I was more so focused on some of the players up front. Um, and, and so as, as you mentioned off the top, Bridget, like, um, Matthew Patra and, and Scott, you mentioned him as well. You know, it's interesting because you said that the, when we're talking about Bussy, there's no room for goaltenders on the NHL roster as it currently stands. Center ice is a different, it's a different story. Like, yes, the Bruins signed Morgan Geeky and, and, and Boquist and Patrick Brown in the off season, um, but, you know, you lost Bergeron, Krejci, and Nosek. So you lost three of your top four centers from last season. And I don't think anybody in that dressing room 
thinks that they have a spot locked up. And if they sign somebody to be a center and somebody pushes them out of that position, maybe they go to the wing. So I, I, I just wanted to, you know, talk about Patra because I think it was my first time seeing him in, you know, this year in game action. I didn't get a chance to watch any of the rookie uh, games in Buffalo or wherever it was, but I mean, you, you, you see everything everybody talks about. You see the hockey IQ, uh, you see the tenacity, his, his willingness to go wherever it takes uh, he's creative. He has vision, patience, and so he's 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 a good player. Like he he finds himself around the puck all the time. He knows where it's going, and he makes those plays. Even if it's like a there was one play where it was just a simple loose puck in the neutral zone, and he just you know outreached his opponent and nudged it past uh, the defenseman. And I think DeBrusque went in on the left side, and it's just little things that that add up that not everybody on the ice can can do. And so, look, obviously Zaka and Coyle are going to be your top two centers to start the year. But I don't think Morgan Geeky has 3C locked up, and I don't think Patrick Brown at all has 4C locked up. So, I mean, is there a world where Beecher's your 4C at some point and maybe Patra is a, is a 3C? I don't know, and there's, there's a lot of time to go. But I, I know that it's, it's NHL or juniors for him, right? So it's kind of a tough predicament. But he looked – I mean, he, he looked really good with DeBrusque and Van Riemsdyk, who, by the way, Van Riemsdyk was I – I know he was playing a lot of – unproven players, but he could still move out there. And I was impressed by how he looked out there today. So um, yeah, how do you guys, how do you guys think about Potra's chances? If he continues to, to play the, this well, this preseason, do the Bruins find a way to keep him on the roster to start the year? Well, let's just put it this way of the four centers that played tonight, he was the best one. And Morgan geeky was one of those centers that played. Um, and he found himself with two of the better players um, which, you know, maybe means he's up in the depth chart uh, in in someone's mind, Montgomery's mind, or really they just wanted to see what he could do alongside NHL talent. But if you look from top to bottom, the centers that they played today, Beecher, Brown, Harrison, and Geeky, he, he outplayed the other centers. So um, he is young. He's 19, as we've mentioned before, and he – you know, he did have a crazy esque pass. I know Scott has made this comparison um, in previous podcasts where he passed it through the zone, what would normally be kind of a, a dangerous pass through the slot, but it found where it needed to go. And it was like, okay, he knew all along that's where he was going to go with it. And uh, it worked out. So um, a lot of the times with guys like that, when they're young, there's a learning curve to that too. Like you want to try a creative pass or you want to try one of those like through the slot, like through the center of the zone passes. And sometimes it gets picked off and you look stupid, but he didn't have any of those rookie like moments. So it's not only did he score and, and get an, an assist, he also just didn't make those mistakes. If, and the, the, I guess the one thing to look for would be like defensively. Did, did he have any issues? I didn't notice any glaring defensive issues for him. And he was good at he was good at defensive zone faceoffs, so you know that that helps out a lot. Yeah, I did. I didn't make note of like one play where uh, Patrick kind of like pulled up and, and almost seems like I kind of get caught between like two minds. Didn't really know exactly what to do, and like kind of didn't really like directly turn the puck over, but sort of turned possession into like a scrum along the boards because he just sort of held on to it a little too long. And that's popped up a couple of times in training camp too. Like I've noticed that in practice. And that's, that's just a matter of getting used to the speed of the NHL game. Like in the OHL, he probably had more than enough time to do what he did, you know, hold on to it a little longer, evaluate his options. And in the NHL, even against, you know, against the Rangers roster, that was kind of like the Bruins. It was, you know, maybe 40% NHL, 60%. Um, AHL and prospects like it's still a lot faster so but even that like that was really only the one one time I noticed that where it was like oh I, I think the game sped up on him a little other than that he he did look really poised and he seemed to have very good spatial awareness and, and you know not not get himself trapped and not hold on to pucks too long so um, yeah it's really encouraging to see and you guys are right. Like, no one should really feel locked in. I thought it, Jim Montgomery made an interesting comment after the game. He was asked to evaluate all four centers, basically. And on Morgan Geeky, he said, 
said something along the lines of like I, I thought that that line sort of picked their spots to like to really play. And he was like, you know, sometimes veterans do that in preseason. It's just it's just part of you know them building their game. And I was like, well, it, on the one hand, yes, that's true. Like you know, people who've been around the NHL, veterans tend to not bring it 110% their first preseason game. On the other hand, I'm like, I don't know that Morgan Geeky should really be that comfortable. Like he, I kind of feel like he does have to bring it, it, especially if he wants to win third line center, because Brian, I agree like that. I don't think he's locked into that. I think he's the clear favorite to win that job, but he still has to win it. It's still not going to be handed to him. And yeah, like if, if Potra continues to impress and that's a spot he ends up winning, I mean, Geeky could get bumped over to the wing. He could get bumped down to the fourth line. Um, you know, I absolutely think there's a chance that Potra could take that from him. It's, you know, I still think Potra has a lot more work to do. Like he's clearly the one, you know, sort of fighting the uphill battle and, you know, kind of coming from, from the outside. And Montgomery even said that he was like, you know, it's still five more preseason games, two more weeks of training camp. And and one thing Montgomery has made clear, he's like, it's going to be the guys who are playing the best at the end of training camp, the guys who have gotten better, you know, from start of training camp to the end who tend to make the team. So Padre has to keep it up. He has to keep going. He has to get even better. Um, but if he does, then he absolutely has to be part of the conversation. It's, you know... I, I still would have him on the outside looking in. Like I still think it's it's a lot to ask for, you know, a nineteen year old kid who hasn't played a second of pro well, you know, hasn't really played pro hockey to to make the Bruins out of camp, but um, you know, more performances like Sunday will certainly make an interesting conversation. Yeah, and Monk, one of the quotes Montgomery had about him, he's uh Brick asked him after the game, you know, what he saw from him and like what his chances are of making the team. And he says he, he needs to show us he can play consistently and handle the, the grind and physicality as a 19 year old. And he did mention, he's like, yeah, well taking those hits, it hurts a little bit more in the NHL. <laughs> I mean, I, I liked him a lot. I think a lot of the little things he did caught my eye and that's like being in the offensive zone and not, if you don't have a play not throwing it up to the point where it can get picked off by the defensive winger. Like he, he, he throws it back down low into the corner. He was good at protecting the puck and, you know, for his, his size and his, and his young age, I thought physically he handled himself well. Um, in a situation where the Bruins are not going into a season with a full NHL roster, all jobs locked up and there's spots up for grabs. My concern is that you're going to have, a, if he continues to play standout hockey like this, leading up to the regular season. It, that's the kind of the, the asterisk with what I'm about to say. But if if he continues to have a strong camp, I'm concerned that, like, you're going to – because it's juniors or, or NHL for him, he can't go to Providence. And you guys can explain to me why that is in a minute. But um, he had, like, 95 points, 96 points in 60-something games last year in juniors. So it's like, what's he going to do? Go down this year and get, like, 110? It's like, I, I just – at what point – if, if it's, if Providence isn't an option, I don't know. I, and, and he'll perform as other players in camp. It's like, give the kid a chance. Like, I mean, uh, Wyatt Johnson in Dallas, 19 years old last year, like it happens. Um, and, and the Bruins aren't really in a position of power this year to be like, Oh no, we need to have, you know, high caliber players, every position, like with a ton of NHL experience, like they're kind of, they're kind of in a, in a, you know, rebuild on the fly at certain positions here, especially at center. So, um, I don't know if, 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 if he earns it, I'd hate to see him go down to juniors for something like that. Um, cause I think that at some point you've kind of done what you can do down there. Can you continue to get stronger and faster? Sure. But again, you're still playing against junior caliber players. So if, if that doesn't help him play in the pros, I don't know. Yeah. And also, also worth noting, like they could keep him into the regular season and there is, I mean, meant to try to look up the exact uh, ruling. I don't know if it's eight, nine, ten games or whatever that you can play in the NHL and then the team has to decide either you're staying the rest of the season or you go back to the OHL. So, um, you know, the Bruins could 
if he's close enough, give him some regular season action and, and then decide. So that's also an option. But again, he's got to, he has to get through training camp and keep building his game and keep playing like this, keep impressing. And, you know, that's, that's still a couple more weeks before, before we get there. All right. Who, who says no, who says no, uh, Van Riemsdyk, Patra, DeBrusque line, the exact line was today in the regular season. Who says no? Keep Charlie Coyle with Trent Frederick. I I would say no, just because I think. Whoops! I just uh, I just kicked my table. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's all right. I've been having technical difficulties the whole time. But if you if you're watching, you know you probably noticed me like fidgeting with a million things because all of my technology is broken and my phone is overheating and my laptop is broken. So yeah, Brid- Brid- Bridget's Bridget's in the middle of like a two week war with technology. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I guess I would say no to that line just because that probably would be like the second line. And I just wouldn't trust that enough. So like I, I, I want to have a little more balance. Cause that, that would mean your top line is Martian Zaka Pasternak, which looks like a great line, but at least to start the year, I, I think I want to have a little more balance. And so what if, what if Charlie Coyle doesn't turn out to like have chemistry there and doesn't like it, it, we've said before is, is Charlie Coyle more than a third line center. They've tried him higher in the lineup before and it hasn't worked. What if it's, you know, what if we find that something's stagnant there and we, and, you know, and the Bruins want to put Charlie Coyle back with Trent Frederick, if they want to put him back in a third line role. I, I know it's crazy. This kid's 19. Yeah. I mean, I, I think whether, whether it's Coil or Patra, because I'm, I can't possibly be totally sold on either one of them as a number two center. I would want to give them one of Marchand or Pasternak to to really help kind of carry the load. Um, you know, I, I like to me Van Reems like is I ideally a third liner at this point who can probably cut it in in the top six still and and be just fine, but um, I just think like you'd be asking Patra to do a little too much given the matchups he would face. Um, you know, if it's Van Riemsdyk and, and DeBrusque, I'd like to like to give him one of Marchand or Pasternak if he ends up that high in a lineup. The other option is, you know, if Coyle does work just fine as a second-line center, you know, we've, we're expecting maybe a Marchand, Coyle, DeBrusque line, like that could work and be just fine. And then you could potentially have a third line of maybe Frederick, Patra, Geeky. Like, I think that could potentially work. Or, you know, maybe Jacob Lauko fights his way up or something. But, yeah, there's, there's a few different options. And, um, you know, just if, if you're the Bruins, like, it would be very exciting if Patra does force his way into any of those roles. Um, that would be a great sign. Another player we'll be watching to see if they can force the issue is is Georgie Merkulov. Now, he didn't play tonight, but he's another guy, highly skilled forward, um, yet to make an, you know, have an NHL job. And so he'll be he'll be somebody to watch as well, I, I imagine, their next preseason game. Um, another player who should be making a, a name for themselves this camp would be Fabian Lysel. And after one preseason game, and again, I get it, it's one game, but – preseason is a sprint and I think he had three shots on goal and you know he wasn't really his speed is evident okay his speed is there obviously his skating ability is there I think he was he was uh he, he was skating hard to get back on back on defense um so you, you could tell that he knew that he the importance of playing well tonight but uh and that's, you know, those things are good to see. But I think when you're supposed to be an offensive player, you kind of have to show a little bit more of uh, assertiveness and, and dominance in a game like this against, you know, a, a lot of non-NHLers on the other side. So, um, Scott, you were there in person to kind of see it from a bird's eye view. Bridget, you I know you were producing the Red Sox tonight, but um, so I don't know if you had a chance to watch the whole game, but just your guys' initial takes on the Red Sox. Let's just, let's just not talk about the Red Sox, okay? All right. It's almost over, Bridget. One, they, one, one they, more week. They ruined my entire day today. So 
they went to the seventh inning, rain delayed for two hours, and fully knowing they were going to cancel that game. And that just made me had to work longer. Then I came home, watched the Bruins. Been working since 9 a.m. We're recording this. It's almost 11 p.m. So, Brian, thanks for mentioning the Red Sox. I did watch the whole game. I did watch the whole game. Okay, anyways, what do you think of Fabian Lysel? <laughs> me? Yeah, um, you can go first. I, I mean, it was an it was an underwhelming performance. Um, yeah. Probably would be the – and, like, when other guys are jarring the attention, jarring the eyes of coaches, you know, fans – he wasn't, and he's somebody that has the skill set to do that, but he he just – I don't know if it was just a bad line combination for him. Um, he he ended up with playing with Frederick a little, I believe, um, and Geeky, but he, he just kind of got, like, lost in the shuffle, it kind of felt like. Um, and he had a decent – uh preseason last year so we'll see he'll obviously he'll get a few more chances to showcase himself but it was underwhelming and maybe he needs to be put out there with some of the higher caliber players to kind of showcase himself but you you're you're not in a position to to say oh well next time I'll do it like you only have a limited amount of chances that you can really prove yourself and and in terms of the stories, and unfortunately for him being as highly touted a prospect as he is, you're, the bar is higher for him. So when he misses it, we talk about it. Yeah. I mean, he started the game in a line with Jason Magna and Brett Harrison, which, um, you know, now Harrison is certainly somebody he could, if he's in Providence, he could potentially play with. Um, you know, Harrison's a player that Burns are pretty high on. But that's obviously – that's a different spot than, you know, Potra getting to play with two proven top six forwards. Like, so, yeah, I cut him a little slack. Like, he's, you know, if Lysel makes it to the NHL, he's probably not playing with a player like Jason Magna, who's been, you know, a fringe fourth liner up up and down between the NHL and AHL his whole career. Um but then when, when Patrick Brown went down, the right wings did start shuffling and rotating through different lines, and obviously he is a right wing. So, yeah, he played a little bit with everyone. Um, yeah, like I noticed him I noticed him making some good plays either away from the puck or pursuing the puck, but Fabian Lysel is a player you want to see him making plays with the puck, and I, I just didn't feel like he had – I didn't feel like he had a ton of possession or really, you know, a ton of chances to do anything. And maybe, again, maybe that's a product of his line. I do think they got pinned in their own zone a little bit. Um, you know, Jim Montgomery after the game did say he, he thinks Lysel played his best in the third period. So that's a good sign. Like, you know, at least he didn't get worn down over the course of the game or whatever. Like, you know, at least in Montgomery's eyes, he finished strong. But yeah, well, but you definitely, he also, you definitely he, want to see a little more. He also had a stupid tripping penalty in the third, though. Yeah, like, true. He also had a very avoidable tripping penalty. And the Bruins ended up having to kill five uh, five penalties. So. Yeah, I think you you made a good point where you say um, he was making a lot of good plays uh, away from the puck, but you want to see him making plays with the puck. And again, especially against the um, – a non NHL Rangers lineup. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things where he, it's like the Tyler Sagan effect where like you watch Sagan in Dallas. A lot of times, like where he's like, he looks like he's four checking a million miles an hour, but he's just not really doing really much of anything. Um, and so it's just like, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's something that he's got, it's an uphill battle at this point. I mean, one game down. So um, he's going to have to, to, to showcase better and, and make things happen, put some points on the board and, and say what you want about, about Patra and, and, and his chances. I mean, he, you know, he leaves the, the game and, you know, goal and assist and, and look good in the power play, look good five on five. And, you know, he made, he made his name stick out and Lysel really didn't, especially when all eyes are on him uh, up front. So um, a lot to be desired there after one preseason game, plenty more to go. Um, we're 40 minutes in here. Bridget, Scott, any final storylines to follow from the first preseason game? 
just sort of uh, circling back to Beecher a little bit, the, the line that he started with, you know, before the inside game jumbled was with AJ Greer and Patrick Brown. And it was interesting. And I think notable that, you know, it was Patrick Brown getting bumped over to the wing for Beecher to play center. Um, but that line was really physical and was really getting in on the four check. And it was, in addition to everything else Beecher did, it was good to see him throw, throw a couple hits too. Like that's, that's something where, you know, I think the scouting report on him was always he uses his size, you know, more just to kind of shield guys off and, you know, either protect pucks or just kind of outmuscle guys, but wasn't so much of like a checker. And I think he's added that to his game. And, and he, he talked about, you know, yeah, as he got, you know, through his first pro season, he got more comfortable with that um, down in Providence. And I thought you saw that tonight too. So like, that's, that's encouraging. Jim Montgomery made it clear day one of training camp. One of the things he said was he wants the Bruins to be, to be more physical this year, especially uh, around both nets. He said that was a point of emphasis. So, um, you know, just a, another another good thing for Beecher to bring. AJ Greer was flying around like he always does, and he ends up getting in a fight late. Um, so sort of, you know, a, a class, classic AJ Greer game. Uh, yeah, got, got a shirt pulled over his face and Took took a took a pretty good punch there, but uh, yeah, yeah, that was a loss. That was a big L. Yeah, um, a big time L on that fight uh, for Greer. <laughs> but my final point is actually uh, about Beecher as well, and I think he has the right mindset going into camp. I think he knows exactly his role that he needs to carve out for himself. I think he's he has it clearly defined in his own head, and whenever he talks to the media, and I remember this about him last preseason as well. He, I think he's a pretty smart guy. Like he, the way he talks about what he needs to do, it's it's pretty spot on. And so I believe you asked this question in the in the locker room post game uh, about four checking or checking um, that he gave the answer about um, you know what he needs to do. And he said, if you're going to play a bottom six role, uh, you need to be physical and not pass up um, on any hits, uh, and you know be a strong four checker. So. Uh, he's definitely gone in with a mindset to be that more physical type of player. And it's clear he's targeting a bottom six center role. And he made a good case for himself. He made a nice little move and went five hole for his goal, um, which was set up by Zaboral. And what was kind of a, a good transition play by by Zaboral, um, like one of probably his best moment of the game. But, I mean, we're talking about Beecher. Uh, the thing about preseason is, can, can he do it in his next performance in the preseason? Because it's going to be more consistent. Obviously, only six preseason games in total, and he's not going to play all of them. So such a limited sample size. But he, he seems to have his mind in the right spot. How did you two like the jerseys on the ice? Um, it, it's, it's still going to take me a little bit of time. Like, Especially watch from level nine. It's like you look down and the – they don't really look like Bruins jerseys when you first look at them. Like, obviously, if you're looking at them up close and you see the logo and everything, like, uh, yeah, obviously it's a Bruins jersey. But just from from afar, it's like, you know, the the gold is clearly just a different color than the yellow that we've been so used to seeing forever. Uh, I also I realized today I don't like that there's the patch on one shoulder, but not the other. I don't know why that sort of asymmetry bothers me, but um, I I realized tonight that it does. So that's, I'm going to have to, going to have to find a way to get past that. But because symmetry is beauty, Scott. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, so we already said what, what we think about it. I said they're growing on me. I haven't seen them in person yet. I said, when I first saw them, I was like, I was thrown off by the sparkliness which don't get me wrong, I love a good sparkle. But um, then when they revealed Marshawn as captain and they did the whole video with him, I, I liked them a little bit better there, but I, I have not seen them in person yet, like, close up. And uh, I think I'll, I'll give my final judgment when, when I do that. But, Brian, this is your segment. We don't want to steal it from you. Well, look, I will, I will say this. The, first of all, the sparkles are stupid as shit. I can't stand them. Um, now you can't see them from watching them on TV. So whatever, but it's like, 
just so – that's stupid. All right, I'll tell you the things I like about them, okay? The third jerseys are great, all right? The white jerseys are clean, and the dark jerseys are clean as well. And I say clean because I do like the fact that they got rid of the shoulders, okay? So, like, the white jerseys, it, it's white on the shoulders, and the black jerseys, black on the shoulders. Yes, they're, they're way too busy, like too many stripes, all that stuff. I would forgive it all if they had yellow. They like they're celebrating their hundredth season and they choose their hundredth season to look absolutely nothing like the team that they're celebrating for being around for a hundred years. The gold it, it it's not it's not it's not a Bruins gold. It looks like Vegas. They look like they look like a they look like a college club team out there. Like I, I don't think like the, a little bit like some penguins jerseys have had that color before. Yeah, it looks like it looks like a it looks like a bad Vegas like stadium series jersey. Like I don't think the I don't think the hockey uniforms are bad, but they're not Boston. Oh, it would make more sense for Vegas uniforms to be sparkly than Bruins ones too. Well, that you know, little they gave, Yeah, they, they they sent their they they fired their coach. He went to Vegas, so the Bruins are trying, looking for something other other Vegas magic to be good this year, but. Um, the, all, or t- all- tonight, actually, because of Bussy, I was thinking it, like it's Western Michigan colors. I'm like, yeah. oh, maybe, maybe that's why he played so well. He just felt like he was back in college. Yeah, I mean, like, I guess I'll put it to you this way: like the white jerseys, I think you'll get away with it more because they're white, and you will. For and the, the the black jerseys, like, there's no there's no yellow socks, but um, yeah, you watch it, and unless you see a replay, and like it's like a it's like a player, you know, you're seeing the front crest, like you said, Scott when you're watching the game from like the broadcast view on TV, you you just don't think you're watching the Bruins. And it's like, like, what are we doing? So um, like, like, like they're okay, but they, it's just not, they're not Bruins uniforms. And I do like the logo. I I forgot to say, I I like the logo. Um, Again, the, the, the coloring is wrong, but I do like the logo. And so I like the logo and I like the clean shoulders. Um, But everything else is just like, you know, they just overthink everything. It's like, what is this is is 100 years like like the gold celebration or something like it's a wedding anniversary like i don't i don't get it i don't know what they're doing but it looks nothing like the boston i don't know Bruins. if anyone's ever been married 100 years brian so i'm not really sure if they have like a official thing for your 100 years <laughs> oh and I, and I, and i also don't like um the white numbers like they have white numbers on the black, on the on the back of the jerseys it's just it's not the bruins have never had white numbers on dark jerseys ever so um look whatever the jerseys they're not terrible, but they're just, it's just for a Boston Bruins setup. It's just not, it's just, I don't feel like I'm watching the Bruins. So good, good, I will good for them. Say, like, they, they, they mess it up again. Yeah, I'll say Swayman, if you saw Swayman's mask and they did a little bit of a thing, like a closer look at it after the game, he has like his art, like his artist that does his mask, like kind of nailed it. I feel like nailed it more than the jersey designers did because his, his artist painted his masks with those same logos um but in the gold color and like he he had it all laid out nice with thumb stripes um you know anyway check it out if you haven't seen it i feel like his graphic design like an artist get those people on it next time they were good well i just don't get it It, 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 this would be like this would be like the the blackhawks or the canadians or the Red Wings, like for their hundredth year, just like changing their colors from like red to a dark maroon or brown. It's like you're changing your colors. Like, what do you what are you doing? Well, and and they nailed the logo on the ice, which prominently has the yellow. So it's like if they'd just done that, like if you just matched the two, would have been great. By the way, I had to look this up since uh, it came up, but the longest marriage ever. Uh, 86 years, 290 days. What the hell uh, were they when they got, was this like a weird, like they got married at 13 or something? I don't know. Uh, Herbert and Zelmyra Fisher from the U.S. They were married 86 years before Herbert passed away in 2011. So that, where were they from? What, <laughs> what state? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't uh, read any more, but there's, there's, there's a little trivia to, to end on. Here we go. Well, well, hopefully this jersey marriage for the Bruins gets annulled after one season. Well, <laughs> it, 
so Herbert Fisher was he was 106 when he passed away. So he was I don't know. I guess they were 1920. Yeah, or that's not he was 1920. Yeah, that's not crazy. And no, I will, as long I will, as she will... wasn't 14, that's fine. She she I, was two years younger. I I will say just like I guess like my last like I will say the the gold is what screws it for me. Like I would forgive the too many stripes and the blacks because they've they've already been wearing black socks. If they just did the same uniforms, but it was just their their regular yellow, I, I'd be fine. Like in fact, the white ones would be would be beautiful. Um, okay, so scale of one to ten then, because we Scott thought you'd be kind of a similar rating as him, but I think you're going to be worse. One to ten, what what's your rating? It's on the, the gold, like the main one, the one they wore today. Well, I, so the ones the ones they wore today, I like the least of all three. I like I like I like the third jersey the most, then the white aways, then the dark ones. Um, but if I'm doing like all of them, if I'm doing the primary home and aways, um, the, the the it's just not their color. The gold screws it for me, so I'd have to give it like a like a five and a half or a six, like. I don't know. It's just not that that color screw, ruins everything. It, otherwise, I'd be I'd be fine for one year, but maybe like a five and a half or a six. I, I do love the logo, and I love the shoulders being clean. I think stop it, right? Yeah, I was gonna say. I think I said like six and a half, maybe. Yeah, I was, I was somewhere around there, but yeah, they, they could have. They, I mean, they could have been an absolute. They could they could have had the best uniforms in the league if they just like modified the '80s jerseys. Um, I will say that the third jersey is a solid, like, you know, nine, ten. Yeah, that's, that's I was gonna say that's good. that's like at least an eight and a half for me. I, I do really like that one. So, all right, well, we'll see if we'll see if these ones from today grow on any of us, um, or if we'll, we see yeah. them closer up and we just go blah. But we'll get used yeah. to it. I mean, every, everything normalizes, I suppose. But um, yeah, I don't know. Not that I will say. Uh, um, at J Fresh Hockey on Twitter, every one of the things he does like every preseason is he has people grade every team's uniforms and then like compiles it into you know a ranking or whatever. And the Bruins went from top five last year to with these new jerseys falling outside the top ten. I think they came in like thirteenth or something. So um, yeah, it seems seems like most people don't you know certainly don't like them as much as as what they had. But you know what pisses me off too, and I know we got to go, but it's like you mentioned it. The ice logo was yellow, and their Twitter pictures were yellow. It's like it's like they get off like trying to like fuck with us and like mess with our minds. Like like the teaser video they put out, they showed the bottom of the coil third jersey. So you think it's like the main jersey, and it's like oh no, by the way, that was just a third jersey. Like our red jerseys are gold, like they're gold. Like this is like the time that that USA fucked up their jerseys. Uh, for the Olympics, and Brian DM'd them and like got blocked or whatever. <laughs> he was like, "Hey guys, you you effed up these jerseys. You should have went blue or whatever." What was your what was your message to? Them? <laughs> the Bruins are gonna get a similar message. <laughs> it's it gonna happen with DMs. You know, like honestly, like they just they just always find a way to screw things up. They they screw up in the playoffs. It's like it's so easy to just have a good set of uniforms when you're an original six team and the Bruins just, you know, they got that new hub on Causeway, the billion dollar, like they, they think they're the shit now. They think they're too cool. It's like, Oh yeah, I'm going to do gold jerk. What are you doing? What are you doing? I hope they, I hope they lose 82 games this year. 82, 82 and all in those jerseys. <laughs> okay. You're right. 5.5, right. but you're making it sound like you think it's a negative 100. <laughs> no, nah, I'm just, I'm being, I'm just being funny right now, but, um, yeah, the, the it's getting late. Brian, Brian's getting delusional. <laughs> oh, and and who, who would have had money on Brian being the one that went crazy at this time? I slept for four hours yeah. last week, guys. I had a wedding. I drove from Connecticut to work for nine. I don't know. I have one brain cell working, but mm. I do like the white jerseys. The black jerseys, they just I don't like them. <laughs> You know, you know what? Actually, you know what? I think these might be the best Bruins stories of all time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, right guys. Um, uh, since I'm in control tonight, I'm ending the podcast. This is has right. gone, oh, wait, gone wait, too wait. far. Wait, we have a Zaka episode posting. Uh, the episode after this one, Scott had a one-on-one with Pavel Zaka. Um, so we will have that up uh, a day after you see this one. So. Yeah, uh, it should be like Tuesday morning, I think. So, yeah. 
Then we got we got another preseason game Tuesday. I'll we'll probably react to that. And then I think they're what back home Friday. So yeah, back back in the back in the swing of the game schedule. Mm-hmm. And and hopefully, well, luckily, only one week of crossover with Sox and and Bruins games. So I don't I can't handle any more of this. This one right. day, <laughs> this one horrible day. All right, Scott. Well, all right, Scott. I'll, go I'll ahead and end it. <laughs> Shut us and, off. And, and, all right, here we go. Hey guys, thanks right. for watching the Skate Podcast. If you want to see more of our videos, visit our playlist. Not in front of a screen. You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow us on social media. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment.